today on Call Out. Parks Canada search and rescue are busy hauling hikers off Canada's West Coast Trail. And later, SAR rookie Sibylla Helms is put to the test. I was actually in disbelief. I thought they were running a scenario on me. It was my very first day here. Friday, 8.37 a.m., Port Renfrew, British Columbia. Parks Canada rescue team members Danielle Thompson and rookie Sibylla Helms are tasked to rescue an injured hiker off the West Coast Trail, a 75-kilometer stretch of beautiful but unforgiving terrain. Masanda Gad of Bothell, Washington, slipped and fell hard on a rocky beach, seriously injuring her shoulder. She's in severe pain, unable to hike further, and stranded near Walbrand Creek at kilometer 53 on the trail. The call-out had come late the previous day, but heavy fog hanging over the coast made a rescue in darkness too dangerous. The subject was stable and could wait until morning. Today, the fog is even heavier, ruling out the use of a helicopter, which would be a much smoother ride for a possible bone fracture. The rigid hull inflatable boat, or rib, averages 27 knots. They'll reach the subject in approximately 40 minutes. Today's mission is just one of more than a hundred call-outs Parks Canada Search and Rescue will do every summer on the West Coast Trail, when more than 7,000 people commit to this grueling six-day pilgrimage through mud-sucking trails, up and down steep ladders, over huge slippery boulders, around unexpected obstacles, and across vast expanses of soft, sandy beaches, incoming tide lapping at their heels. The weather can be unpredictable. The bear, cougar, and wolf, dangerous. Hikers enduring this knee-twisting, gut-busting trudge carry everything needed to survive, in and out. Nothing gets left behind. It's the ultimate Canadian wilderness challenge. Not everyone makes it, and when they don't, invariably the West Coast Trail search and rescue team gets the call. So the two primary ways we access people that are injured on the West Coast Trail are through by boat or helicopter, float plane. And to be able to do that and provide that service, you have to have trained staff that know the area like the back of their hand. And that's 90% of the training we do is local knowledge training. And it comes with years and years of collective experience here. So we just tied her up really tight. Mm -hmm. The five-member rescue team lives and works together at their base in Port Renfrew located at the south end of the trail. Two members are always on call 24-7 during the five-month hiking season. Working eight-day shifts, the teams cross over every Friday to share information, strategize, and maintain equipment. 11.05 a.m. Danielle and Sibylla have arrived at Walbrun Creek to evacuate the injured subject. They anchor about 100 meters offshore, knowing full well the closer in, just below the surface, jagged volcanic rocks are poised to rip the drive shafts right out of the rib's powerful engines. Even if they made it in, heavy shore surf could swamp the boat in a heartbeat. Then they would all be stranded. A small inflatable tender will be used by the team to row ashore. Okay. We're off. Our most dangerous spot is right in the surf zone. So when the waves are coming in, it's really easy to turn a boat and the waves can flip you. And that's when there's opportunity to get pinned under the boat, to get swamped, you know, that's when hypothermia comes in. With Danny keeping a watchful eye, okay, Sibylla right. times the landing to ride the crest of a larger wave high up onto the beach. They pull the tender clear of the surf and the rising tide. On shore now, the team moves into the medical phase. All team Hi. members have, at a minimum, okay, advanced yeah. wilderness first aid training. Okay, so is it okay if I'm just gonna open it up and take a look? Oh, sure. Yeah. There was an emergency doc on the, in the team today. Oh, okay. So she did some assessing as well. Okay, and what did she say? A lot of hikers run into doctors on the trail and they say, oh yeah, a doctor said this and a doctor said that and so-and-so gave me these painkillers and this and that. 
then we're assuming that that person knows what they're doing and, you know, I didn't meet the doctor, I don't know who they are. So we always have to make sure we go in and look at the injury or the complaint, ask about the mechanism of injury, just so we get a bit more history and detail on what we're dealing with. All right, so it's possible you might have something right in there then, right? I mobilized her shoulder with um, triangle bandages. Just made sure it was up against her body and she couldn't move it. So if we did move, that it would move with her body rather than flopping around, which would cause her a lot of pain, maybe make it worse. Our whole uh, goal is to get her to help where she can get an x-ray in a hospital. Today, the surf is low. The ride out to the rib will be relatively smooth. Um, we were really lucky because Walbran is a bit of a steeper beach and it can get to be pretty uh, crazy in there with the waves, so all the stars aligned for that woman today. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go in, Danny? Yeah. Okay. Danny will okay, stay with Masanda, but helps launch Sibylla, who's taking the camping gear and Masanda's two hiking partners to the rib. Heading into the surf can be tricky and often dangerous when the waves are large. The boat can easily take on water over the bow and be swamped. As the hikers wait for Masanda to be brought to the rib, one describes the accident, typical of many on this challenging trail. They were about 10 minutes behind me. And so I stopped, took my pack off, went back to where it was, and as they started coming, I'm like, hurry, hurry, you know, the tide's coming in, and the waves are just starting to lap up at the shelf. Just before she got a foothold, she just, uh, I don't know what foot, it had to be probably the inside foot, just went out. And she went down and then slid into the water. I'm like, ouch, you know, but she didn't get up. I'm like, just like, oh, she's really hurt. I'm like, oh, you can hear the, the sound of pain. Transferring injured subjects from the tender into the rib is difficult, even in calm seas. During the move, the severity of Masanda's injury becomes evident. You okay? Awesome. Do you need uh, any loosening at all? No, I'm good. Okay, we're gonna get everything on the boat now. After deflating the tender and stowing it on board, they get underway. The bouncy 50-minute ride back to Port Renfrew is at times painful, but a small price to pay for rescue off the trail. They arrive at the SAR base in Port Renfrew to sunny skies and calm water. Being four kilometers inland, the weather here is often much better than on the exposed west coast. Going up the staircase from the dock is likely to be the last bit of hiking Masanda will do for a while. For Danny and Sibylla, there's paperwork to take care of and equipment to get ready. They never know when the next call-out will happen on the trail. But there's one thing they do know for sure. It will happen. Monday, 10.30 a.m. at the Carmona Lighthouse Station, kilometer 44 on the West Coast Trail, and the Parks Canada Search and Rescue Team are having a busy day. We've got two calls going on right now, both of them low urgency, but we've had to split up. Shannon's on her way to Camper Creek to pick up a hiker with uh, an injured knee. I'm on my way to Cribs Creek uh, by foot to pick up a hiker's uh, backpack who's got an injured knee. Like many parts of the West Coast Trail shoreline, Cribs Creek has very heavy surf, making it extremely difficult to land a boat. Jeff will hike the two kilometers to Cribs Creek, assess the injured subject, then carry her gear back to the lighthouse. The subject, Emily Parsons of Ontario, will make her way there as well with her hiking partner. They will all stand by for evacuation by Shannon on the rib once her mission is complete. Walking the two kilometer stretch of beach will take Jeff approximately 30 minutes. So in the presentation outline, we'll cover permits, high table information, I'll show you how to read the tie charts. During mandatory orientation sessions, Parks Canada staff do their best to prepare hikers for the rugged reality of the West Coast Trail. They don't take you off the trail because you have blisters. They note that rescue teams are in place only to deal with medical emergencies on the trail, and there are no shortage of these. With 38 steep ladder structures, suspension bridges, aerial tramways, tidal surge channels, slippery trail sections, unpredictable weather, and a host of other challenges for even the most experienced hikers. Yeah, how was it, guys? That was awesome. Was it? Oh, yeah. The little narrow shelf, I've got a hike in behind me there. 
got to know your ties to get past here. If you're going out and tie this too high, then these waves are going to wash the shelf. And you've got only about three or four inches wide of uh, terrain to get past. You can go up high and uh, hike around the trail and get around this, but uh, a lot of people like the adventure to hike over the rock and, and through the surge channels like this. Jeff arrives at Cripps Creek, and as usual, the surf is high. You know, this is uh, more of a surfer's paradise than a place to land and pick somebody up in a small boat. So we uh, we just don't do it. Sorry, how about your knee? How's it feeling? Um, like by the end of yesterday, I could barely walk on it. And so yeah. The rest of the just up the beach, morning, Emily and her hiking partner Ivan are found nursing their pride and lamenting the need for evacuation. But it's hard because, like at this instant, I'm like I could do a bit, bit more. But like by the end of the day yesterday, I could barely bend it. Yeah. Yeah. So. No. We're being proactive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, uh, I hear you. So probably the hardest thing for people is actually getting over just having to leave the trail early. But uh, we just see gray whales out there. We're gonna have a really good boat ride home. Cool. So that'll be fun. Not everybody gets a boat ride. I know. Yeah. How does it feel your, uh, Jeff surveys up? Emily's knee and confirms that she is able to hike the two kilometers to the Carmona Lighthouse for pickup. Oh, yeah, yeah no, good call. Thank yeah. You. Shannon reports in from the rescue mission at Campers Creek. Go ahead, Shannon. Okay, I'm about uh, 10 minutes from Carmana, and uh, Emily and Ivan are uh, taking their own time behind me. Good Emily's pack. I'm hiking back to Carmana. I'm gonna let them go at their own pace because she's uh, she's really close to not being able to move that knee at all. She's devastated, obviously, about having to leave the trail early. So we'll try to make her feel better about making the right decision and not getting stuck somewhere where we can't get in and get her. Two hours, both missions are over, and the team is back at the SAR base. All in all, it worked out really well. It took about five hours to complete those two, and uh, the weather was somewhat cooperative with us. And now we're ready to go and, uh, and get back out there again in case something else comes up. The West Coast Trail. It's wild. This is bear and cougar country. There's no bus, no taxi. In some places, you can barely walk. One slip. One twist is all it takes, and you're stuck. And then, for you, the most beautiful sight on this trail is a Parks Canada search and rescue team coming to take you home. Now, getting to know the West Coast Trail. It's covered with roots, uneven uh, footing, uh, lots of mud, and the infamous ladders that uh, seem to stretch up into the heavens. Back in 1906, they carved a rudimentary trail through West Coast temperate rainforest and pieced it together from old First Nations trails and game trails and whatever else existed. This trail is very rugged and very long. <laughs> there's a lot of creek crossings, there's cable cars, there's a suspension bridge, there's tons of slippery, mossy boardwalk. It's covered with roots, uneven uh, footing, uh, lots of mud, and the infamous ladders that uh, seem to stretch up into the heavens. It's endurance. It's five, six, seven days of straight hiking. It was never designed to be a, uh, an easy trail to hike from start to finish. It was just primarily some access through crazy rugged terrain. For over 35 years, Parks Canada Search and Rescue have been responding to call-outs on the West Coast Trail. From May to October each year, over 7,000 enthusiastic hikers set out to conquer 75 kilometers of one of the world's most demanded wilderness experiences. It's a real test of a person's um, mindset and their survival mode, you know, to stay thinking positive and just to try to make it through. Some people have never had a wilderness experience, and this is their very first one. I don't know how to describe it, but you see it on their faces. They're absolutely shell-shocked <laughs> at how hard it is, and it's very, very, very hard. <laughs> The 
the search and rescue station where the five team members live and work through eight day, 24 hour shifts is located at the south end of the trail in Port Renfrew. Here, the two person rescue teams are closer to the most difficult portion of the trail where the better part of an average of 100 callouts per season occur. The hardest part of our job is, is often just trying to figure out um, where exactly the hiker is. There are many unique challenges for these medical rescue specialists. Unforgiving coastal terrain, extreme weather, dangerous ocean swells, and deadly marine environments demand constant training and equipment maintenance. Being a new recruit on this team can be quite an adventure. I was actually in disbelief. I thought they were running a scenario on me. It was my very first day here. And uh, Rick comes up behind me and he says, okay, Sibs, you gotta get ready. You know, we got a call. So I just got everything together, got ready, got my pack, and uh, we were on our way. It's a steep learning curve and learning where we can access certain areas on the trail, what time of day, what kind of tide, whether it's foggy. It takes many months of training, learning how to handle the, our small surf boat, making sure you can row in uh, through the surf onto the beach safely and, uh, and be able to pick up a, a patient, put them in the boat and get them safely back out through the, through the surf zone. There's a lot of sprains, twisted ankles, knees, shoulders, some illness. We've had some pneumonia on the trail, or suspected pneumonia. So things have been pretty minor so far this, this season, which has been good. It's been really good warm up to everything. Two things that we look at when we're training up a new person. The one dynamic where it's is somebody that needs to develop skills as quickly as possible in terms of how to make urgency determinations and, and where she can and can't go at, at her skill level. The other dynamic is that we have somebody training that person. So that person is also learning a tremendous amount about yep. being able to pass that knowledge on. When training Sibylla, I'm trying to instill in her that looking after the equipment is absolutely key. Secondly, I'm trying to hammer home the idea of getting our systems down so we do it this way and we do it the same every single time so that when it becomes stressful you can fall back on that training. You know just by working together and communicating efficiently and and you know showing that we're that we're a team I think you know people are looking and they're like okay I can trust these people. Yeah. <laughs> The team here has been training me up really well, giving me time to learn those skills, but also giving me the opportunity to test my limits a little bit and yeah. to find a level where I'm, I've been humbled a couple times. So it's, it's great, yeah. Mostly what they're trying to provide Sibylla this year is hands-on experience with the first aid and then a ton of experience with the local knowledge. So every chance we get when we're out there, um, trying to pass on as much local knowledge as we can to Sibylla. It looks nice up here. Just seeing what that boat is capable of is really good as well. I've always been a little bit afraid of those big ribs, so. <laughs> yeah, I trust it more now. You are alone. A lot of days you get out in the boat and it's a big sea and you look around and you feel pretty small out there on the ocean. There's nobody else around and when you land on the beach, you're the only one in the area too. So you also have to be very careful of your own personal safety. The seas kick up, the winds kick up. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, engine failure or, you know, you've hit something in the ocean. You just never know really what you're, you're in for. So for me, I think, I think being on the water is a very humbling experience and uh, you really just have to be on top of your game. It's not like driving a car, you can't just sit back and cruise. You're constantly watching the waves and the waves are always changing. There's different refraction off the rocks, the wind direction's changing, the swell is changing. So you're always trying to adjust to the different waves and driving. You're trying to allow this person to have these experiences where they're, they're working on the edge and they're pushing their, their limits and their limits are butting up against something that 
that could cause them harm. So you need to constantly monitor where they're at in terms of, of their comfort level and skill level. So you know they're bumping up against the, the edge, but they're not passing it. The surf zone is like the worst part of this whole thing. I uh, haven't swamped the boat. Um, like I haven't turned one over. Uh, I've been learning a lot from everybody else's stories. I surf, so I've been in some scary situations surfing. So I have a real firm respect for the water and how fast it can take you down. You can be sitting out uh, 100 meters from shore and it's, you know, fairly calm, but on the beach itself, the surf is just pounding. It rises up and just pounds. Most of us have been slammed there once or twice where you're, you're rowing ashore and it's, everything seems good, then all of a sudden you're six feet above the beach and then all of a sudden you're slammed, you're on the beach and it's dry underneath you and you made it, but you still got to get back out to your boat. And you don't want to do that with a patient on board. A lot of this stuff I'm just learning on the fly with as I experience it. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much how you, how you learn things here is trial by fire. Call out search and rescue features, real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.